just, you know, that the Irish welcome or a thousand welcomes is still there for everyone uh, when they're ready to come back to Ireland. And the other thing is we can always take bookings as well. <laughs> you know, dream now, plan now, travel later. So, um, you know, that's uh, very much our mantra here in the office in Adams and Butler. And it's also great, like, you know, I hope, you know, people, you know, in America, in Canada, et cetera, and in England, um, it's great to have three celebrity chefs together. And, yeah. uh, you know, you've got uh, Patrick, who has had a Michelin star since 1983 and uh, two Michelin stars since, uh, was it 1996? And 96. then you had, 19, oh, wow. And then uh, Bally Malou had Michelin star as well, the actual country house, although Darina is here talking to us in the main about the cookery school. And uh, then I'm sure after only four months, um, you know, uh, although having a background of having Michelin stars abroad, but, you know, a, a few Michelin star restaurant, uh, it's amazing. And also it's lovely that it's outside of Dublin because, you know, it's, it's nice when you've got um, a dispersal of uh, fine dining and uh, amazing food throughout Ireland. We're at 88 now, um, so maybe just give it another minute or two and uh, we'll kick off. Oh, hi, Danette. Ah, um, it's just that someone, some lady made a comment there that the video and mic isn't working. So if there's any other difficulties, let us know. It might be just in that particular incident. Um, and oh, welcome. Darina here, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. I'm just going to see, can I see you? We'll be putting the spotlight on you. Actually, might as well put the spotlight on you now. Um, no, it's okay. just to make sure that I'm online or whatever. Yeah. Perfect. And thank you very much. I was just saying we had Adam on the farm and yourself doing a class. Ah, <laughs> oh. <laughs> teaching you how to milk cows and make cheese. Oh. <laughs> Good. Uh, Kitty, lovely to see you again. So, cool. so we're at 97 when we hit that magic number of 100 we'll start and then uh, the people at, you know that join us later won't have missed much as such so at 99 now so by the way that's another thing thank you very much to everyone around the world uh, who does you know join us to hear about Ireland because like it gives us a buzz and it you know makes us happy that you still care about us even though you can't visit us at the moment and you still have that interest uh, for Ireland and all things Irish. Um, so I might actually kick off, Gio, what do you think? Or should yeah, I, make... I think we're good to go, 102 and still growing, so we're ready. Brilliant. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you very much everyone for joining us. You're all very, very welcome. Um, as I was just mentioning earlier, uh, but a lot of you may not have heard it because it was when we were sort of warming up. Uh, we've done a series of webinars in Ireland and at first, you know, we were getting our partners and our friends and people like Porrick, who we meet later around Ireland, you know, joining in and doing PowerPoint presentations and telling us about different things, you know, that happen all over Ireland. And then we moved on to experiences. So we had like the Dormant from Hayfield singing a song. We had the Marian showing us their uh, art afternoon tea and, you know, fantastic things all over the country. Porrick had dancers dancing on a stone on the beach for us. Um, but we felt that, uh, you know, we wanted to evolve it a little bit further. And we decided we'd talk about themes that are still in Ireland so that we will be putting an itinerary that we've just put together yesterday based on the presenters and the people you're going to uh, talk to. Today. Oh, and they're all included in it. Um, so uh, any information you need, like it's uh, Adams and Butler, the e email address is sales at Adams and Butler, put it in the chat box and uh, we'll answer it as much as we can. And as I mentioned uh, before, we will have a recording going out to everyone. Um, I would ask the, you know, the wonderful chefs that we have joining us, um, that if there's a question to to them, to share. that and the same might have the information for that they uh, help us out on the chat box. Okay, so uh, we're going to start. Um, so, how Siobhan, do you want me to share the itinerary now or at the end? That might be a good idea, yeah. I'll put it in the chat box or do you want me to, yeah, we'll put it in the chat box and people can have a look, but I think we can start with Darina. Brilliant. Uh, so you can put it in the chat box now. That is fantastic. Okay. So I, uh, brilliant. There's Darina. So um, Bally Malou Cookery School and Bally Malou House Hotel, like 
since a child, I, I actually am annoyed with myself because I wanted to bring my uh, Christmas cookery book, which I use every Christmas. It comes out for all those recipes. But can you tell us about the philosophy in Ballymaloo, you know, about farm to table, etc., and how important it is with the younger generations? Oh, my goodness. I think, um, well, Ballymaloo House, a country house hotel down in the south coast of Ireland, uh, East Cork, uh, was opened as a country house hotel and restaurant uh, in 1964. So, and from the very first day, uh, my mother in law, Myrtle Allen, cooked the food of, that was on the farm in season at the time, the fish that came in from the boats of Ballycotton and so on, wrote the menu every day, depending on what was in season. And so that was, uh, you know, 30 years before the term farm to day table was actually invented. Uh, it was, it's sort of, it's just the way we are. It's the, it was a way of life and a sort of, for us, a logical way to do things when we were, we were in the middle of a farm. And the cooking school is a little, a couple of miles from Ballymew House, and that's in the middle also of a, a farm, a hundred acre organic farm and gardens, which means that we can grow a lot of the produce and produce a lot of the foods that the students actually cook with when they come here and they come from all over the world. The cooking school was started in 1983. And again, the menu changes every day, depending on what's in the, what's growing and in the gardens and in the local area, what produce we can get from our artists and producers. And the reason why students, I think, come from all over the world and uh, basically is because they can come and they can literally see how the food is produced from the seed of all these kind of terms that uh, are relatively new, but uh, they absolutely love to be able to reconnect with how food is produced. And we have, um, we're very lucky, we have an acre of greenhouses as well, so we, which we use like a protected garden. We have even a longer season, grow all sorts of things in that. And then we have some free range pigs and our own little herd of Jersey cows for milk and butter and thing and hens and and um, and also beef cattle. And so it's a lovely environment, a non farm cooking. It's a lovely environment to have a cooking school in. And we do everything normally. We do everything from afternoon cooking demonstrations. If you happen to be in the area, you can come and join us for class in the afternoon to days, weekends, weeks, three months at a time, or sustainable food production courses, or how to make butter, cheese, or yogurt, or how to, you know, make salamis or butchery or fermenting or foraging, anything we think people might like to come to. But we're very lucky that we're in the middle of a farm and literally you can see everything to all the stages from the seed right through or from the animal. Uh, what you can then, it ends up with a, not a celebration on our plate. An honourable end, yeah. And Dreena, you were also involved in setting up the uh, foodie festival in Ballymaloo and also then uh, the farmers markets concepts as well. You're very strongly involved in that and supportive. Oh yes, well, uh, uh, my brother Rory O'Connell, who co-founded the school with me, myself and uh, Rebecca Cronin, we ran the Ballymaloo Literary Festival for five, six years, and literally again, people we had. Oh my goodness, it was so exciting. We had the the top chefs and cook uh, and writers and so on, uh, literally from all over the world came to Ballymaloo, farmers and chefs and, and food people, food writers. That was really exciting. And also uh, I, I, I've been involved in many things on and off over my, uh, my long career. I'm now 72 years of age. I don't know how that yeah. happened. Anyway, and I'm <laughs> very fortunate to be, you know, involved at the school every day and all of that. But anyway, one of the things that I was involved with and actually inspired by the first farmer's market that I saw in San Francisco, golly, 35, 36 years ago. At that stage, it was actually in a parking lot in San Francisco before it moved into the Ferry Plaza building. And when I saw that and I suddenly was like a light bulb moment for me, uh, I could see how when a lot of the supermarkets at that time were going over to a central distribution system and local shops were no longer selling the local food because it was going into central distribution, I suddenly realized that if we could restart the market system in Ireland, uh, local people could buy local food from local producers. And of all the bits and pieces I've been involved in in my life, I think if you ask me what is the thing that I think that has made a difference uh, and that I'm proud of and that really has made a difference to many people, it's starting the farmer's market in Ireland. And that was about 30 something years ago, the new age farmer's markets. Now at a time when I can tell you here in Ireland, if you actually set up a stall on the side of the street 
to actually sell somebody off a stall, people, you know, you'd always want to be on your knees before you did that. So it was not, it was not looked on as a glamorous thing. Uh, when I started in the beginning, it was almost looked on as uh, going backwards, but quite quickly, we made people realize that this was part of a new way of a new way forward and a way that lo uh, local farmers and artisans could get the full price for their produce and the pat on the back for producing something uh, uh, quite different. So you knew exactly who's the, who, the, who produced it. There was the traceability and a lot of smaller production systems. So people who are, had, you know, making farms or smoking, uh, smoking fish or, you know, making uh, uh, something on the farm could actually continue to live on the land that they love because they could add value to their produce. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Doreena. And it, like, it also helps those, you know, local one man bands and one woman bands to stay in their local communities and keep the schools open. Um, so, yeah. And um, also, and Myrtle was the first woman to have a Michelin star as well, wasn't she? In Ireland? Absolutely, yes. And, and Myrtle was such a pioneer and such an inspiration to me. I'm a daughter-in-law and, uh, you know, I, I feel so fortunate that our paths crossed in life. I mean, I know not everybody says that about their mother-in-law, my sadly now late mother-in-law, who uh, she was such an inspiration and such a support uh, to me and to all of us. She taught us, passed on everything, and she just cooked the food that she loved. It was not, uh, it was just the food of her local area and what was in season. She didn't even look to see what a lot of the, she had no training uh, yeah. and wrote the menu every day and just cooked the food that she knew how to cook herself she had no idea how to do a lot of the really fancy food that a lot of the chefs did. And yet, of course, she was uh, serving Irish food so proudly and Irish food in season. And she always knew the quality of the produce we had here in Ireland at a time when, you know, most of us had an inferiority complex about what was in Ireland. We were sure that what you had in, in America or the UK or in the continent had to be more delicious and sophisticated than what we had. We're talking now the 1960s, but she truly knew that here in Ireland, we're able to grow and produce some of the best produce in the world. And she didn't, she just, and people came and she served them the kind of foods that they, she served to her family and to her guests. But every day, you know, she would serve mackerel when it was fresh in Valley Cotton or a beautiful head of fresh uh, Savoy cabbage from the garden served deliciously local ducks, you know, at a time when people in the restaurant, restaurant food and home cooking were a totally different thing at that time. And now, uh, and then she really, it was more like sophisticated home cooking, but really knowing that if you had beautiful produce, you had to do, you know, all you had to do is cook it so simply for people to go, wow, this is delicious. And indeed she was, uh, rewarded for uh, and recognised with a Michelin star, which she was very proud of. Fantastic. Thanks a million, Dorina. And just uh, for everyone, the itinerary that we have also have has um, a stay in the Ballymoney Country House. So whilst you're there, you could stay longer and perhaps even do a short course. A lot of people are asking, can you see the gardens and greenhouses? Yes, you can. And the other thing is Ballymoney is part of the Blue Book properties. And we're going to move on to another um, Blue Book member, and that is Patrick Ebo from Restaurant Patrick Ebo in Dublin. Um, just, uh, just sorry, really quickly, there's some really lovely comments there about someone who spent their honeymoon, uh, Martin Rapp, honeymoon in 1975 at Ballymaloo House and learned how to make scone. And uh, someone who's doing a course right now, uh, currently doing the 12 week course. And oh. uh, someone who bought your book about 30 years ago. So really lovely comments there. Uh, no, we'll come back to them later, but I just wanted to address them. Thanks. Hello. So um, we, by the way, the other thing is the one comment that we're getting from every single client that leaves Ireland is they're in shock at how good the food is. They mm. sort of, they, 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 they now, now realize we can cook it well, but it draws attention to the fact that we have good organic natural products. And like they say, it's far superior to a lot of what they get in the UK. So it's a comment we get, you know, constantly all the time. So uh, Patrick. Hello. How are you? I'm, I'm well. Well, so you first came to Ireland in 1981. Now, I assume it was you, a woman that brought you here, but you set up a fantastic restaurant and you've been going strong since. 
Well, prior Ireland, I was in England and I met my wife, Sally, which is Welsh, um, and I moved ah. to Dublin in 1981. Um, because I've always felt the product in Ireland was fantastic. I used to buy my product uh, uh, from Ireland when I was when I had my store in Manchester. So it was I was on, uh, um, I was always very very pleased with the with, with the quality of the product we could get in Dublin or in Ireland in general. Uh, by large, and obviously there was some shortage of different things in 1981. We you know Ireland today is a much better place for product than it used to be then. We have, like Derina said, we have an awful lot of very, very good producers of food today. And I think for me, the most important thing in the restaurant business for when I cook is the product, the quality of the product I do. My skill of cooking or, or doing anything with the food is done to me, so I have to reproduce the product which I get from the, from, from the farmer or from the fisherman or from the butcher, whatever it is, which is very important. And, and I must say that the progress, the progress we have been made in Ireland in the last 40 years has been incredible. Um, you will know that today we have, by capita, we have more Michelin star and uh, top quality restaurants of all of England. Um, and the quality of food, as you say, prior, prior, the quality of food in Ireland is far superior in general. I'm, I'm saying in general, not uh, most of the European country, because we have quality of product, A, and we have young people in the trade who are coming through, who are really love what they are doing and, and open restaurant and put their heart into it. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to see uh, the progress Ireland has made in the last 40 years in food, food, food wars anyway, generally. And, and also, um, the one thing that I think, you know, um, you're located beside the Marion Hotel, do you find that uh, when people come in from abroad, they're surprised at the quality of the restaurant, um, you know, that is in the capital city of Dublin? Yeah, no, I, yes, they used to be surprised, but not anymore. I think people are now very well aware of that uh, uh, Dublin, or Ireland in general. You can't say always Dublin, but in Ireland in general, are a, a very good culinary history now. We have, we have now becoming a, a, a country where uh, people can come and put in Italy in and in, in relax about it. They know that they are going to get some very good food. Uh, there is some very good restaurants all over Ireland, which are they don't have to be Michelin star, but say all of the restaurants in Ireland are fantastic. I mean, last year in the Michelin World, we get more awards than anybody else. We are Ireland, Ireland, we had we had we had a fantastic success. So I'm very proud of being part of it. Uh, I bring I bring a lot. I think in some ways in in not in the not in, in, in the cooking like there in Adi, but in cooking or, or, or teaching the young people of Ireland how to prepare meal and to, to make the, the food much better and also to find product which we need to use here uh, like you know the the, the old fall and you know, with people which we don't have to eat in the old days Ireland used to like to eat cream cut if you like but now today it's moving in the right direction we are starting to eat all kind of very quality of food and it's, and it's good, but it's still local. I think it is very important that we have to learn to have local product made by local people, served by local people and cooked by local people. Because your cheese board has a lot of amazing Irish cheeses on it as well. Uh, we have, I mean, that's the, one of the biggest progress. I mean, I, I remember in 1981, we I practically couldn't serve Irish cheese on, 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 the, on, my, on my, in the restaurant because they were too salty. And obviously, as you know, you put salt in the cheese to preserve the cheese a bit longer. So, so we have, but now it's not the case. Now they are, the, the cheese, the Irish cheese are very, very good. They're in par with French cheese, they are fantastic cheeses. And, and, and it's good to see, I, I, know, I know the big progress of the, the Irish thing. I mean, in Gilbo, in the, rest, in the restaurant, we have now half and half is French, half is Irish. Uh, and nearly now, we move nearly practically to all to, to Irish cheese nearly. Um, because we couldn't, you know, because the quality here is so good. You know, the quality, for us too, too for, for me, it's always about quality of the product. That's fantastic. And I have to ask you, just has the taste for Irish people in wine evolved as well? Well, that is, yes, obviously. I mean, you know, when I first came in Ireland in 1981, it was Blue Moon. Blue Moon was the, the one of the day. <laughs> Blue Nun, sorry, Blue Nun, not Blue Moon. Blue Nun or, or Piet Beaujolais, but now, no, 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 we have now a fantastic array of, of, of wine coming from all over the world. And, and it's good. I mean, not only French, but Australian and American wine and German 
Italian, Spanish. You know, they are all, they, they are all coming. We, and people are traveling. Irish people have been traveling all over the world. Right? They, when they come back, they acquire the taste of good wine, of quality wine, and they, and they do drink very, very quality wine, which is fantastic. You know? yeah. And I must say as well, Irish people really support the, 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 us as, as restaurateurs in general. Yeah. Um, we have very great support from the local people. And, and it's great to see all our American friends coming in in the, in the summer and, the, and, and uh, embrace what we try, what we're trying to do here in, in, in our land. And it's amazing to see the quality of, of, of the customer. You, know, you can't have a quality restaurant if you don't have quality customer. Yeah. And we have an incredible quality of, of, of customer in, the, in our land. And it's amazing because you see articles written about the fact that there was, you know, a lot of new restaurants came into being during the Celtic Tiger, but then they stayed and they were still supported by the Irish people, even when the recession happened. People will pay for good food. And they no, 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 people will, no, people, no, people, learning how to eat and learning how to live is part of, is part of, our, of our education. You have to, to learn how to eat properly and to, to drink properly and, and to live properly is part of the education of everybody. And, and, because it's like going to the theater or you have watched a film or reading a very good book, you have to learn to appreciate your art. You have to have to have learn to appreciate it. And, I, and people, Irish people do appreciate things. They are well educated people and they appreciate the things. And certainly people who come to, to Ireland, they come for one reason in Ireland, I think. Uh, it's not for the weather, but yeah. it's for the quality. <laughs> it's for the quality of, 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 the, of the life of the Irish people. The green field of Ireland and the beautiful weather we, with the beautiful uh, scenery we have. The quality of the service, the atmosphere given in restaurants, in pubs, in yeah. hotels is there. We have, we, it's all there. It's part, it's part of the makeup of the Irish people. They absolutely love receiving and speak to and be, be kind to people. And, and I mean, you know, if you go to uh, any pub you're on today, on your own, you're on your own, I guarantee you, with five minutes, people will speak to you. You say, where you come from? And the pub food is fantastic in Ireland. It's so clean. Like it's not, so, yeah, it's, salad, yeah, it's, it's not pretentious, it's the quality of the product is so good, people don't have to do anything. Yeah. Just, just serve it as it is. No, that is what it is. Brilliant. So thank you very much, Patrick. So we're going to move on now to the Emigrants Commemorative Centre in Connemara. And while Gia was just setting that up, just to say that in the itinerary we have in the chat box, we do have a stay in the Marion Hotel and the, the restaurant Patrick Gibo is right beside the Marion. It's, um, so, you know, you can, it's both are included in the itinerary that we have. And uh, like I myself bring all my kids to celebrate our special occasions in uh, Gibo's restaurant. So, Mark, how are you? I'm good, Siobhan. How's everyone? So, you're going so to show us. Tell us what you're going to show us. Yeah, so, are those ones here the That means it's a little bit funny. Do you want to come closer to home? As I said, I greeted everybody there in Irish as you're ah. in the, uh, the Milton area here are the areas in Ireland where the majority of people speak Irish. So I guess I'm fortunate, along with I, you know, you're going to meet in a minute and Mary later on, that we're fluent Irish speakers and they're one of the 10% of the population where Irish is our first language and, and we use it on an everyday basis. So anyway, uh, as I said, I've been working uh, with Adams of Butler, with Siobhan and her excellent team there for about two years in creating uh, various experiences around food, culture, um, heritage, history, etc. And our emphasis always is to, to bring clients and bring visitors to Ireland to, to the local experience and that they get that local experience, that they meet local craftspeople, local food producers, musicians, artists, etc. So as they get that real personal feel to, to what's going on. But anyway, our theme today is food. And uh, I mentioned Eileen earlier, but we're actually located here in uh, the immigrant just we've lost you again there. Center. So the immigration mm -hmm. center in years. But just to, to let you know a little bit more, um, we will introduce you to Eileen. So Eileen, tell us a little bit about the current day immigration center here. Well, sorry, we can't and, see uh, um, the, your images. This project that has been taken years in the making and been the last two years. Okay, Laura, can you hear us then? Hello? Yeah, we can yeah I can hear you now. Yeah. Can you properly? Can you? Um, can. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, I can we get can. you now, so I'll, I'll stay in this position. Yeah, we can't see you actually from the beginning. Your image is frozen, so you haven't moved since you started talking. The image is frozen. Hello. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, will is, we come back to you in a second? Or yeah, do you want to find yeah, another location? Um, yeah, yeah, if you don't mind coming back to you, Adam, G Giovanna. Yes. And then we go on to Adam and then on to Jordan and then back to Porik. Has that? Yeah. One second, I'll just find Adam. Here we are. Hello. Hi, Adam. How are you? I'm good, yourselves. Well, thank you for uh, having me. Um, oh, hello to everybody. So I'll just give a quick introduction. So this is Adam Apelous, and he is what they call a permaculturist uh, down in West Cork. So not far from uh, Bally, well, not near, because that's sort of in East Cork. But anyway, in Cork, same county, but it's the biggest county in Ireland. <laughs> And he's going to tell us about agro, sorry, about permaculture and why he studied the field, uh, like of permaculture. So, do you want to go ahead, Adam, there and tell us about permaculture? Yeah, perfect. So, I'm going to give kind of a brief, a brief understanding of permaculture because it'll be too much to try to go into in detail. So, really, what per, can everyone hear me? Okay, is is my sound and everything okay? We can hear yes, perfectly. Yeah. Brilliant. So, yeah. So, um, permaculture really, it's an ethical design science. And what it means is you are creating a design by using the science that is there, so the facts of what's there and what is, and you are designing it in an ethical, sustainable way. So like one quick example would be, I've taken over a farm and on the farm we have poultry, we have vegetables, we produce um, berries and so the pasture raised chickens. Now, by sticking all these systems together, what we tried to do is we tried to have the, the chickens will eat the waste from the garden and then the chickens waste, so the chicken manure will go back to feed the garden. And in turn, what you start to create is a cycle where we grow all our produce with the fertility of the chickens. Now we add to that and we compost it in a sense to make a more diverse uh, medium, but all our fertility comes from the farm, which is quite a huge thing because we do produce quite a lot. Now, so that's kind of that's that's it's 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 your your it's and it comes down to construction as well. So it's 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 taken into every aspect because what you're essentially doing is trying to create a system as opposed to one component. Like you could look at a vegetable farm alone, a standalone system, but that's not sustainable because where are where's the fertility coming from? Do you know where are the seeds coming from? So when you try to set up a permaculture system, it's you are trying to sustain whatever it is. That you're that you're trying to produce. So um, I started this. Sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Go on, go on, sorry. No, go on. I interrupted you. Sorry about that. Yeah. So so um, I started this about six years ago. Um, I was well, seven years ago. I was in Spain, and I got into organic production, and I got into talking to a lot of restaurants and just getting into organic food. But then for me in Spain, you saw the real problems where you have a lack of water. So it got you see the need for it. Um, now I wanted to pursue this 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 um, permaculture. So I found a course in Ireland. I went back to Ireland to do the course. I did that for two years. Then I moved to Germany and I started to put this all into practice. Then I got um, an opportunity to go to Australia to study with the PRI Association, which is the Permaculture Research Institute of Australia. Okay. You and then from there, it just, it, just, it just all blossomed and it went really quite quick. So on this, sorry. And I'm sorry, you're-, you're On this farm. It's fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. On this farm, then uh, when I went to Australia, this is the, this is where I really got into it. So we really got into sustainable food production. We got into education, designing. There was a lot of aid work. So from Australia, then there was a lot of traveling to the likes of Morocco, to Jordan, the Middle East. There was more work in Central Europe. Um, so yeah, I followed this and it was creating education centers and stuff like this and sustainable food systems. So then eventually, um, for personal reasons, I had to move back to Ireland. So I wanted to start this now in Ireland, where there was a very little sort of, um, it wasn't really happening here. There are a few kind of institutes, no, you wouldn't say institutes, but say groups that are that that are doing this. So um, I came across a farm. Now this farm is the farm I'm currently at now, which is a, a poultry and organic vegetable farm. 
and basically from this farm I've taken it over and now we are starting to we, we're producing we're producing at the local farmer markets just as Darina Allen said so we're very we're very involved in the in the farmers markets um, which is huge because it brings all these local kind of producers together so now we have an opportunity to produce the food and bring it straight to the customers where there's a huge there's a huge diversity of as uh, Patrick was saying as well and um, there's a huge diversity of um, food in, in, in Ireland and food being produced in Ireland um, and as you have you have different types of cheeses you have different types of smoked meats and fish you have and so many different organic the, pro the project you did in Cork City and the Warrior Botanicals because you won the Green Small Organization of the Year in Ireland but a lot of it was to do with projects you had done so do you want to tell us about Cork City the kindergarten and the Warrior Botanicals yeah perfect so basically um, I was I I was approached by um, the um, I was approached by a few different organisations about doing this project in Cork City and bringing this aspect into the city centre in Cork. And so what we did was we were working uh, with the HSE, and it was about creating uh, mental awareness, but also how within the cities when you have very little life and it's very you could say like a concrete jung jungle in a sense, um, it can be quite traumatic and it can be quite hard to kind of find that space, like the park space. So what we did was, it was a mixture of food and um, the connection to nature and how important the, 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 the biodiversity is. So the project was to set up food system within the city center that was public, it was a public space, so it was open to everybody. We also use certain trees, which are, so in climate, in, in, in this, problem with the climate now and pollution um, forests are very important but where we need trees and certain types of trees which are quite aggressive at taking carbon out of the, out of the atmosphere or just pollution in general and um, we should have these trees in the front line which is the cities where the most pollution is, is created so this project was about bringing food it was about bringing carbon um, sequestering trees into in, into a small space um, which worked fairly well and from this, uh, we had huge feedback and um, it, it, it started other similar projects. And then also, so on the permaculture side of things, you have, it's, it's um, again, it's linking different sort of components together. So education is a huge part because we need to have this understanding of food and where food comes from and where health is. You know, we're in, we're in a time of crisis at the moment, really, with the pandemic. And the biggest thing that you hear is, you know, you eat healthy, stay healthy, exercise. And this is, we are, in a sense, I would always say I'm a nutrient farmer. So I'm not a farmer for mass or for how the vegetable looks, but for the nutrient density of the individual veg vegetable. So what we wanted to do, we were, I was also contacted by a school who was very interested in what we were doing. So it was a Montessori. And we put a design together for the Montessori, which had a huge range of um, how to produce food for kids, so how to get kids to interact with these food systems and have it as part of their curriculum. And every day they're out in the garden, we put different types of mediums down this ground. So we put stone, we put bark mulch, there was grass, there was soil, there was beds for them to work in, everything like this, which is, um, and sorry? these kids like roughly two years old four years old these kids will be two to two to five i'd say two to five yeah. and then usually around five or six you'd start primary school and um, but what was very interesting is we planted a lot of herbs in this and the kids were actually cultivating the herbs so the kids were were starting to take cuttings they were starting to propagate them and then put them back into the into the garden space so there's also another business that i'm that i'm working closely with now which is warrior botanicals now this is all about natural cosmetics and I, I'm going to hurry you up on this one because we're going to move on. But tell us very quickly about it. Yeah, no, I'll speed on it. I'll speed on. So this is, so this is, um, so this is about natural cosmetics. Now, the beauty of this is from the excess um, herbs that was planted in the Montessori. There was too many herbs in the sense that they needed to harvest the herbs. So I got in touch with this other business that I work with that I supply the herbs for, and she makes um, natural um, cosmetics. So all sorts of different. The best deodorant I use actually is from this woman. Um, but now what she does is for the maintenance of the Montessori garden, she goes in and actually harvests the herbs. So she harvests the herbs and now uses those herbs in her cosmetics. And this is the simplicity of what permaculture stands for. It's linked systems that's amazing that's fantastic so the the job is thing yeah yeah that's brilliant thank you very much so uh, studying business people down in that montessori at the age of two and five and um, 
So we're going to, thanks a million, Adam. We're going to, and by the way, a visit to the farm, if you want to see how Adam's farm operates, will be inclu is included in the itinerary as well. Now we're going to go to the outer part of Dublin. Now I always call it the greater Dublin area because always when I say about Dublin, it's almost another product in itself, but there's an amazing property, Cliff at Lines, and uh, it's just fantastic. It's beautiful. It's just, it's one of those places you relax and you forget you're not that far from the city centre or from the Dublin airport. And there is a fantastic restaurant there um, that after only four months accomplished something which a lot of people will never ever dream of accomplishing. So Jordan, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Do you want to tell us about what you did and the ethos of I'm Sure, the restaurant? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically uh, the restaurant is all based around uh, Irish produce. Uh, so basically not taking a new idea, basically doing what Darina and her family has been doing for a very, very, very long time. Um, but we kind of, um, I think we kind of took it maybe one step further of kind of alienating any ingredients that doesn't come from the island. Um, so, you know, we don't use things such as, say, chocolate and um, olive oil and citrus fruits and things like that. And, and even taking it a step further than that. Uh, because you can grow things like lemons and uh, say peppers and chilies inside tunnels, um, but we wouldn't use those neither. So try and keep it as true to um, kind of native, uh, native island as possible. Um, to try and give our food a very kind of, um, kind of original kind of identity basically. Um, and then using kind of in, uh, techniques and things that I've picked up over the years in different restaurants and working in England or Scandinavia, um, and trying to bring those into kind of uh, the cooking that we also have here currently in Ireland as well. Um, so kind of looking back in kind of traditions um, and kind of old methods that have always been used here um, and kind of bring them and put them onto a plate in a very kind of modern way as such. And the thing is just for people from outside of Ireland and actually for yourself, because I, I don't know what the Cornish language is like, but I know the word I'm sure probably doesn't mean weather, but um, the word I'm sure means weather. And it's almost like you're marrying up something that, you know, a lot of the Irish culture is based around weather and we accept the weather that we have. Now it's not the worst. We exaggerate how bad it is, but it's very different. We don't have distinct seasons. You know, we do have seasons, but there's a sort of a shade of gray between them. So it's something that's very sort of instrumental to your ethos as well and what food you produce at the time of the year, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So basically when we was coming up with the name uh, for the restaurant, we wanted a single word that would define everything that we do in the restaurant. Um, so I'm sure it kind of, yeah, means weather, but it also means time um, as well. So basically that boils down to meaning season. Uh, so basically, obviously that means that we run our restaurant very, very true to the seasons. Um, obviously, because we can't, we, well, we don't import anything into Ireland to use on the menu. Um, so if something runs out in Ireland and it's completely out of season, we don't use it and we just we move on to the next best thing. Um, yeah, and no, we don't have that word in the, the Cornish language. Um, so it took a bit of research to try and find it. Um, but no, I think it's a very, very, very beautiful word. Um, and the first thing that anyone talks to you about in Ireland, and I suppose it's probably relative to a lot of countries as well, they always ask you as kind of passing conversation, like, oh, they always talk about the weather, like how, or how's the weather today? Oh, it's pretty rainy today or gray or sunny if you get the nice days. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it kind of, you know, it's, that's the kind of how we open the meal uh, at the start of the evening of kind of just talking about, you know, obviously the word uh, and kind of how we kind of got to it and kind of what it means. Because a lot of people, even, even if they're Irish, they don't know what it means. Yeah. And the other thing is, the one thing that I think is, for, like when I visited uh, Clifford Lines and saw I'm sure when it was opening up the first time, I love to see chefs and it happens in all the better restaurants. You see the chefs running out to, you know, snip off a few herbs and snip this, that and the other and the vegetables and like you walk through the gardens in Clifford Lines and they're part of the Clifford Lines, but they're part of I'm sure. It's very, it's, it's, it's the lovely atmosphere and ambience. You know, you really feel um, that it, 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 you know, it lives by its values as such. And um, you came to Ireland and um, has it lived up to its expectations? Yeah, 100% and more to be honest. Um, to be honest, uh, I had never came to Ireland before um kind of coming to look at the job and look at cliff lines and kind of see what the possibilities were here um but while working in norway um where i was a head chef at a three mission star restaurant 
I had an Irish uh, sous chef who talked wow. very, very, very highly of uh, obviously Ireland being from there. Um, so as soon as a kind of a possibility of coming to work here came up, I jumped on that first flight and I came over and uh, had a very, very quick kind of brief tour around. Um, and yeah, instantly fell in love. And it, I think it touches very much to the kind of, obviously coming from Cornwall, it has that kind of same feeling. You know, I think you get the same feeling from the people that are here and also uh, the setting as well. You know, it's very, it's a very, very beautiful place. Um, but more so here that it's more kind of diverse in its settings. Um, you know, going from, you know, rivers and mountains to forests and you know, it has a very, very big diversity. Uh, which is very, very appealing for me. And you know, as everyone's talked so far, you know, the produce is just world-class. And I think the best thing about that is that the people that grow it, they don't know it's world-class. You know, they're very still humble in it, um, which I think is a big key to it, you know, that they keep on pushing and then they don't kind of come a bit kind of complacent to everything, which kind of keeps the food driving forward and keeps the restaurants pushing even further. Uh, so it's a great marriage. So um, like what Patrick, sorry, what Patrick said as well about pork, I'm going into Irish now. <laughs> what Patrick said, uh, the producers and the suppliers are very important for you and I'm sure then as well. 100%, yeah. I, there's not a producer on our menu that I haven't gone and visited personally. Um, just to kind of, you know, see their practices and just to get a feeling of where they're from and, you know, obviously the ingredients they grow and kind of get a first hand experience too. I think it's very, very important. Um, and also to kind of build up that relationship with the farmer or the grower or the fisherman or whoever it, it is. Um, and also good for our team as well to go out and experience it because we have, um, it's a very interactive kind of dining experience where uh, the kitchen's fully open to the guests. Um, you know, they can see absolutely everything that's going on. Um, we plate every single dish in the middle of the dining room. Um, and, you know, all the guests come down table side and uh, explain and serve the dishes, which is, um, yeah, which is very nice for the chefs and also the guests, you know, so if they have any questions about anything, you know, the, get the, the chef should know <laughs> what it is and how they cooked it and where it's from. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And just uh, to tell uh, everyone that's listening as well that you're only four months in existence before you got the two Michelin stars, which is a really amazing achievement, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it took us by surprise, for sure. Um, you know, we hit the ground running, um, you know, it, yeah, it was only open for four months, but we put about 18 months of research and everything into it and obviously building the restaurant from scratch um, and obviously going out and visiting all these farmers and everything. Um, so yeah, it was, it was probably two, two years up until that point. Um, but yeah, only four months of physically being open, which is uh, unheard of, you know, it's, yeah, it's crazy to be honest. Fantastic, thank you very much, Jordan. Pleasure, and I see also Honor from Clifford Lines is there. So um, in the itinerary as well, we do have, so what we do is have people sort of coming and doing the Marion first and then doing Clifford Lines. Uh, so visiting then uh, Gibos on the way in and there's Honor. Hi, Honor. Hi, Siobhan. Hi, everybody. And then uh, leaving, uh, you know, because Clifford Lines isn't far from the airport as well. So now we're going to go to that amazing food that you've seen. So hi, Paul. By the way, it says Sean on the video, but it's actually our Porik. Yeah, it is indeed. I'm sorry about that breakdown in communication. Um, anyway, we are in the west of Ireland, I suppose. Uh, so as I was saying, we're in the immigration centre here in Karna on the western side of, of Ireland. No. And many people would have left places ashore uh, over the years. But here with me, including actually the, the current mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, whose both mother and father actually live in this very village that we're in today or immigrated many moons ago. But anyway, Eileen is with us here from the centre. And I believe, Eileen, before the, um, the lockdown in March, one of the last groups you hosted here was a group from Portland. And they kind of, you created a food experience with Mary similar to what we see here today. Yes, uh, we, we pride ourselves in being able to recreate food and the events that the people who left would have um, basically passed the stories down to their family. So in addition to Mary Berry and the other local food producers in the area, um, we put together what you can see here today for them. Uh, people come by, they enjoy the ambiance of the area. They enjoy the story of the fact that the building is a community built. Uh, it has been helped by Uther Russell and Fort Ireland, who are involved with it at the moment. 
and with people like Paul Bologna and the great care that he takes of his people, bring resources, um, we can assure them that that can continue. So um, I'd mentioned there, uh, Mary, so what we're doing now is you've probably heard of the, the great American baking show and the famous Mary Berry. But we have one here in Connemara as well. And uh, she does a range of different products like the picnic baskets that uh, you see behind us here and also uh, private in dining experiences in her house. So she's done, uh, she's hosted many groups. But what we're going to do is we're going to meet Mary now. And I, I realize that uh, some of you are in California in Vancouver, San Diego, everywhere. So it's breakfast time. So where better than to look at a different take on the Irish breakfast, the West of Ireland breakfast. Hi, Mary. Hi, and welcome everybody. Welcome to Connor. Coming to Peggy here to join us. And I have uh, down here, John here with me, and he's going to uh, show us how to cook some scallops. Scallops are uh, indigenous to the area. They're beautiful, they're succulent. It's time of the year, uh, they're at their best. And we are going to pop them on the pan, and we're going to have some uh, breakfast of black pudding. And in a moment, we will come back and you will have over this. So take on what the Kanamara breakfast is. Okay, Mary. So tell us a little bit about some of the foods and particularly the way they've evolved over the years. Well, what I have here really is food that is local and it's indigenous and it's really some of the best quality food that you can buy. We're not maybe on the market that people know we're here, which is kind of a bit like a secret. But one of our main foods, like I said, is scallops. Last year, we started a scallop festival. Some beautiful lobster here, Mary. To more seafood, we can never get enough of seafood. So seafood is really is one of the favorites, and we have here again local. We have some smoked salmon. We have some mackerel, which is also being cured, which is delicious. Uh, here is fresh uh, salmon that's been baked in the oven. People love that too. And I suppose here uh, to show you here we have some uh, raw seaweed uh, that's got some sesame dressing on it, and we have some more seaweed here. It's got a really nice tank. Now, you, you have a great uh, some years in Chicago working there. So tell us about the, uh, the famous salted fish here. Hi, Paul. These are local oysters, and they are fat oysters. And they are fat oysters. Sorry. Sorry. Will you yeah. shake the fish? Sorry. Will you share your microphone? Because we can't hear very well. Okay, the microphone. Even if you can... stand beside each other. Because yeah. 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 This. Okay, so we're, we're here. Absolutely, yeah. We're here now with the salted fish. Right, this is the salted fish, and uh, this is uh, this is what we call here the balakui, and it's basically a, a waris a fish. And uh, if you see here, it doesn't have a dental plan, but it uh, it's probably one of the most interesting and tasty fishes. And if you live locally, and if you go abroad, this is one of the, probably one of your favorite fishes that you would miss from home. 
Um, we would fish it almost all year round, apart from the four winters. It, it's usually um, very good this time of the year. It's nice and plump. Um, it it, it, it uh, lives um, close to the rocks and in and we have plenty of those that so we have the perfect rotations of the rocks and that with the it. And have there's it. many an Irish person, isn't there, Mary, that have uh, been stopped uh, at yes. customs? Yes, I was stopped myself when I was younger. When you'd be going, especially to London or to the States, you would dread the old person coming to the house or anybody coming to the house with the bag because you knew that they were coming with a big bag or one of these going over to somebody over there. And when you were young, you definitely did not want it because it has a potent smell to it in, in the sense that it's, you know, you can smell it, smell it before you see it. But those, that smell is, uh, I suppose, so indicative of the area and, and it reminds you of home. You're transported home right away. And uh, even though it doesn't look terribly appetizing, I can reassure you it is really tasty. And people in, I say, Spain and in Norway would have, a, you know, a history and culture of this too. And it is... Uh, well, of course, when, when Columbus and when the Spaniards used to trade with the west of Ireland, yeah. uh, they used to bring wine and return with salted, yeah. salted fish. Yeah. The Spanish would be big into salted cod, and we, we would be too, but uh, this would be particularly local because it's, it's uh, sort of, uh, I suppose, one of the fishes that can, you can actually catch it with a rod if you're on, out on cliffs. So, you know, and you'd also have it all winter long. And in the olden days, you know, food was scarce to a certain degree and people could afford meat and you would have a supply of this and it would last you for the whole winter and then when spring would come and you could actually catch this fish fresh and uh, people would love it fresh you'd have new potatoes milk and butter and you would be saying to yourself i need nothing else because you know you would have the food from the sea now i can get a great smell of breakfast cooking here so why don't we make our way back and uh yeah. see how uh, things have developed. Can you close to the breakfast so we can hear everything? Yeah. Oh wow, the food is amazing. Yeah, we can bring the breakfast here. Yeah. So I was, I, I was saying there, uh, with, just with the tradition of food here and, and uh, the traditions of food and immigration, it was a very important part of people you know, who had family in Boston and San Francisco and Chicago and New York to, to recreate these dishes that their ancestors and forefathers cooked at home. So it was a special occasion for them if there was somebody traveling over uh, to the States that they would bring some of these dishes with them. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things they would say, you know, they'd meet you at the airport just in case you went home and gave the food to anybody else, a fish, and they would tell you that uh, I'm hoping you're going to translate that. It basically means their teeth will be watered in the anticipation of a taste. Of so, uh, you know, seafood will be very important. Yeah. That their teeth? Yeah, the teeth, their teeth will be watering in the anticipation wow. of the smell and the flavour of food from home. So that would be very important, especially with the dry fish, you know, we bring it home. And I know in the uh, recent years, because we can pack these, uh, you know, pack and pack them and freeze them, people have actually gone to Chicago with the frozen food and they'll be going straight home, people waiting for the pan, ready to cook. Um, that's because they would be really desperate for a taste of home, the fresh food. So before Andrew, we sign off, folks, uh, we'll just do an, yeah? Andrew, just quickly, we have a question. What was the fish that you used? Sure. What was the, the fish you used to salt? The ras, what was the name uh, of ras the fish? fish. Yeah. Ras, is it? Uh, ras, which is spelled W-R-A-S-S. Yeah. yeah, so what we'll do, we, I guess we have to sign off now, but there's a famous song about Galway Bay and the sun setting in Galway Bay. So just before we leave you, I want to get Sean to capture this oh, beautiful wow. moment in the bay. It's live, folks. Actually, it's brighter there than it is in Dublin. It just shows you. And it's only a two-hour drive. It is, yeah. It's all, it's always brighter in the West. <laughs> and so just for everyone. So guys, I, I hope you, I hope you enjoyed the, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the evening here from the West. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them.
just before you put it all away, Padrick, will you make a clip for us and uh, send it out so we can add to the recording? Just because the, the sound was a little bit uh, poor and everyone would love to hear everything again. Absolutely. Just to say that Padrick looks after all our guests. He no problem at all. He brings them to an abalone farm in the West Coast, to oyster farmers, picnics on the Aran Islands, barbecues. And uh, there's so many things he does. Like we said, you know, pop up singing and dancing on the beach and stuff like that. And um, like we even had a client who went there for New Year's Eve and went to the TG Cahar, uh, the TG for an Irish party. And it, it was great fun. Um, so is there any questions before we sign off from anyone? A lot of people are saying they can't wait to come back to Ireland, which is brilliant. Um, Siobhan, we did have a question for Jorina um, at the beginning that can she cater for dietary requirements? Oh, absolutely. Like can you lactose hear me? And tolerant and... Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely we can. In fact, uh, this morning's uh, cookery demonstration was about, it was a whole gluten-free, delicious gluten-free food. But of course, we are in the middle of a 100-acre organic farm, so we have so much beautiful produce and we can cater for vegetarians, for vegans, for dairy free, for all of that. But we have our own delicious raw milk from our micro dairy and the butter and cheese and everything. So we can cater for anybody really. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to doing so. Yeah. Brilliant. Great. So we're going to leave it at that. And we can I say one more thing? We just had a question there. Has fungi been found? <laughs> Unfortunately not yet, but we're hoping that he's just hiding and he'll be back soon. Hopefully he's just joined another group of dolphins and he'll be back, he'll be back soon. Because <laughs> that's sort of like popular in Ireland at the moment. We're all worried about our fungi. So yeah. uh, thanks a million to everyone. Uh, we will be sending out the recording because the problem we had with the bandwidth in uh, the west of Ireland, we're going to get that re-recorded, send out a proper recording of that as well. Um, and just before you go to say that, Porik uh, can do, as I said, anything that will all be included in the itinerary as well. And we will be sending out a copy of the itinerary to everyone as well. So thanks a million. And thank you very much to Darina, to Adam, to Jordan, and to Patrick for joining us as well. And then, of course, Porik um, down in the West. Uh, Mary, for all the cooking that she did, it's a shame that I'm not there to eat it. And uh, Eileen as well in the Emigration Museum. So once again, thanks a lot to everyone. And we will be doing an Ultralux webinar next Wednesday, and it will be on the iconic castles and hotels in Ireland. Thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.